I was reading uh, in my devotions this morning, and I thought it would be a good place to start before we jump in. I realize that we are all on probably a little bit of a Thanksgiving weekend hangover. <laughs> we all hung out with family, and so appropriate time to preach on divorce. Uh, and <laughs> I think, God, no, I didn't pick it for this morning, but, you know, the Lord leads in, in his ways, doesn't he? Um, I'd like to read just a, a short little devotional to kind of get us centered where it says, um, uh, like I said, this was in a devotional uh, from this morning, and I printed some copies off if you would like it, but it is titled, When God Has Put His Fear Into Our Hearts by Charles Simeon. He writes, genuine fear of God does not consist in a mere consent or assent uh, to the truth of the gospel or a mere profession of it as the only way to eternal glory. True fear of God is a real surrender of ourselves to him as his redeemed people. The fear of God when genuinely existing in the soul is true wisdom. Without this fear of God, a man views nothing aright and does nothing aright. In his eyes, earthly vanities have an importance which does not properly belong to them, and heavenly realities are in no respect appreciated according to their real worth. But when God has put his fear into our hearts, then our misconceptions are rectified. Sin is no longer that light and trivial evil which we before supposed it to be, nor is salvation judged to be a trivial thing as once thought. The salvation of the soul becomes from that moment the one thing needful, and all the concerns of time are swallowed up in those of eternity." Fearing God is accounted to be folly in the ignorant and ungodly world, but Scripture declares it to be genuine wisdom, and such it will prove itself to be in the outcome. I think Simeon has some wise words for us to think about what it means to fear the Lord. It does not mean to come under a kind of pagan fear that God will do something to us or act out uh, in opposition to his will, which is to love us and to forgive us and to care for us. But it is to recognize, as we were just singing, that God is holy and that he judges all sin and that your and I sin was judged on the cross. And that is the gospel message. is not that God just doesn't care about our sin, but that he has forgiven it through his redemptive work. And so as we come into Matthew chapter 19, we do not want to unhinge from where Jesus was, which is Capernaum, in which he was outlining what the kingdom of God looks like. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it looks like a people who have been redeemed by God's grace. With the faith of a young child, which we protect, which we do not want to create a stumbling block for people. We want people to come to Christ and not to stumble over him, but to come and bow before him and receive his grace and forgiveness. And so Jesus now moves to this new location, leaving Galilee behind, and a large crowd is following him. In verse 2, it's, he's very popular, probably uh, because Matthew says he has this healing power. His healing uh, was important to his ministry. People who were broken, who were sick, were receiving healings. And so along with his healing was Jesus' compassion, that he loved people and that he cared for them. But then in verse 3, it says that there were some Pharisees. These are those who are religious. They are probably people who didn't need healing. They're, they're pretty healthy. And so they came to Jesus and were bringing up a controversy in regards to some of Jesus' teachings. They wanted to know whether Jesus was really adhering to the Scriptures. And so they were challenging Jesus' authority. This passage is to some degree, about divorce, which we'll speak quite a bit about that this morning. But more importantly, it's really about God's Word being the authority and how it is that we read God's Word and allow it to be the authority in our lives for what is good and what is right. And so Jesus has been teaching at these different locations, and certainly in Matthew 5 through 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount, which is a kind of compilation of Jesus' teaching. And in, in, at the end of that, in, verse, or in chapter 7, we see Jesus' teaching, which was common on the issue of divorce. And he essentially is taking on the role of the, um, of the rabbi and telling the people that 
divorce is not something to be um, entered into lightly, that there's only a few reasons for having a divorce, and you're not allowed, in a biblical sense, to divorce your wife for any reason at all. In fact, he goes as far as saying that those people who have divorced their wives, they are the ones who have committed the sin. In fact, a more serious sin, which is adultery. And so this would have been challenging. Now, maybe the Pharisees just wanted to have a biblical argument, but I would at least consider that maybe some of them were divorced. Maybe some of them had offered, had, you know, got tired of their wives and handed a certificate of divorce and felt very justified in doing so. And now Jesus was claiming that they were in sin. And so they are coming to Jesus like, well, we want to address this because we feel that we are justified in our understanding of what the law speaks to. And so they come to Jesus to challenge him and to test him, to ask about how it is that he reads God's word. Well, let's look at that for a moment. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24, this is the text which they are quoting and which they have developed their understanding of when it's appropriate for a husband to divorce his wife. And it says that if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And so there's that little section. Now, that's there's not a period there. there. That section keeps going, but that's the point that they wanted to focus in on. And many at that time had kind of seen uh, that Moses gave this right to the husband and the family, that if a wife was displeasing, and we could def- redefine what does that mean, displeasing, right? Uh, any guys? We'll talk after guys, after the ladies are gone with what, what those things could be, right? No, it, you know, displeasing. And then this word indecent, what does that word indecent mean? And they said, listen, if, if your wife is, you know, uh, not making you happy, then it's the prerogative of the husband to be able, in Moses' law, to dismiss the wife. I think we need to dig a little bit deeper here because in Deuteronomy chapter 24, which we'll, which we'll get to, uh, Moses is really speaking to the sanctity of marriage there. And we can see that when he says that, that marriage and this union between two people is, is very important in the life of God's people. And Jesus wants to emphasize that. But let's at least stop for a moment and, and think culturally what might be going on in this, uh, in this society. So the people at Jesus' day, particularly the men, had all the authority in the house. In fact, uh, when you had a daughter, you would be responsible for marrying your daughter off, choosing the husband, making a deal with the other family, and then that daughter would be betrothed to be married. We can think of, for example, Mary and Joseph and how she was given to Joseph. And there was this time period where it says they were like in a contract together. They were betrothed to be married. It was very sacred. They hadn't done the official wedding date, but it was all set. Mary didn't get to choose. She didn't go on to the internet and find Joseph. Uh, That was her dad who picked out Joseph. And for whatever reasons, you know, and sometimes there's all kinds of reasons why you would marry people. In fact, it's actually not uncommon in the world today to practice this form of marriage, uh, you know, where a wife or or a young girl is betrothed, is given to another person to be married. So that was the context Uh, Today, we don't practice that in Western society, and it's important to kind of look at it, that we uh, can, uh, uh, we essentially pick one another. So my kids, you know, they get to decide who they want to marry. I don't get to decide. Uh, I might have some influence. I might be able to encourage them one way or the other, but I'm kind of out of the deal. Like, they get to just choose, and that's because we live in what we would call a liberal society a free society to where a person gets to exercise their individual rights, their individual liberty. And so a marriage needs to be the union of two consenting people who have agreed together to be married. That's our context today. That's not the context that Jesus is is dealing with, and it's important to recognize that difference. Um, Underneath that, which I think is, is somewhat interesting, and, and, and how we deal with it is that um, in, t- in today's society, our biggest concern is the exercise of the free will. That's what 
a liberal society is. Its main concern is with the individual's liberty so that you can come to this church or you can go to a different church or you can go to a crazy church or whatever it is. Maybe this is the crazy church. I don't know, but you get to decide. And the government's job is to protect your ability to decide where you go to church, who you want to marry, whatever it is that you want to do, you as an individual get to make those decisions. That is what liberal society is about. The government's primary responsibility is to protect your ability to choose what you want to do as long as you're not hurting other people. And that is liberalism, libertarianism, which is pervasive in our society. Now, in 1 Peter, uh, he gives a different idea of what a government's job is. 1 Peter chapter 2, I think verse 13 and 14, somewhere in there, Peter says, listen, you have a responsibility to be submissive to the state, and the job of the state is to do this, to punish those who do wrong and to command those who do right. In Jesus' day, the primary driving force in society was not liberty, it was obligation that a husband had a particular obligation and a wife had a particular obligation. And that was what drove society. And the question that they're coming to is that it was the wife's obligation to make her husband happy and the husband's obligation to care for his wife. And it was the husband who had the right to decide when that wasn't working, when that failed. And just like today, like every marriage today, there comes a point where it starts to break down. And you can imagine that it would break down in Jesus' day. Well, Jesus then uh, says, listen, before we jump into Deuteronomy, uh, let's actually open up God's Word and go back a little further. Let's speak to this obligation and how this works out. In verse 4, he says, haven't you read? And now, just as a side note, it's amazing that Jesus does not just simply say, well, that's what I said, and I said it, so go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, pal. It was pretty clear. I didn't feel like I stuttered. I said, you can't get a divorce unless it's marital unfaithfulness. And they said, wait, wait, that's not what Moses says. And so Jesus says, right, listen, let's go back. Let's read Deuteronomy in light of God's bigger picture in, 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 the whole, in, in the whole of the Scriptures. It's a good reminder to us that sometimes we can come into a text of Scripture, particularly if it's affirming to whatever it is that we want to do, and then kind of protect that, draw a little line around it, and then build a theology around that one little verse. And Jesus says, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to build a theology around what your definition of displease is or what your definition of indecent is. Let's go back and understand this is what God says from the very beginning. He says that that, at the beginning, the Creator made the male and female, and He said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That God has a purpose in marriage. From the very beginning, before the fall, God created male and female, and that they would come together and that they would... Well, what's the reason? It is to reflect the glory of God, to be made in His image. That men and women are made in the image of God and that when they come together in marriage, they reflect this beautiful union which is expressed in the Holy Trinity. So for this reason, a man will be, leave his father and mother and they will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, he says, let no man tear asunder or be separated. If we actually continue to read Genesis a little bit further, we see this wonderful statement of Adam in verse 23 of Genesis 2, where he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is Adam's grave. He's like, aha, woman. How exciting is that? You can imagine how happy he was. Bill Cosby used to tell this joke. I realize he's fallen out of favor, so I don't quote him very often. But he did have this really great joke about this song called uh, 
ain't no mountain too high, ain't no valley too low to keep me from getting to you. And he said, you know, when you're first dating and early in your marriage, that's how you think about it. You're like, oh, ain't no mountain high enough. You know, he says, but after a few years, you know, if your wife is up on a mountain, you turn to your son and go, what in the world is she doing on that mountain? <laughs> son, go get your, wo- your mom off that mountain. You know, and, and I feel that sometimes because Heidi likes to hike. And um, <laughs> what is she doing on that mountain? But that's Adam at the beginning. He's excited. He has Eve. And it's going great. And then she gets into the situation where she gets tempted. And she falls into this temptation. And she eats of the forbidden fruit. And she hands it to Adam. And you can just imagine how dumb Adam is, right? He's like, all right, let's do this. I'll follow Eve anywhere. And the both of them have sinned now against the Lord, and they are hiding from God in Genesis 3. And God finds them and says, what are you doing? And Adam says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid. And God says, well, who said you were naked? Have you disobeyed me? Did you do the thing, the one thing I said not to do, which is to eat of that fruit? And notice what happens in verse 12. The woman you put here, or you put with me here. Notice it's no longer bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It's like that lady over there. She gave me the fruit. She's the one that's the problem. And we see this separation. Now we're ready to talk about divorce. Now we're getting down to where what Jesus is dealing with. He's seen it from the very beginning, how divorce takes place. And it doesn't begin with you and I finding something wrong with each other right, in our marriages. It begins with a disobedience to God, that we have an obligation to obey God, and we fail in that obligation. We sin. And the first thing that begins to happen in sin is marriage begins to break down. And so Jesus' answer to the question, can I divorce my wife for any reason, is no. Because when we go back, we actually see that they are punished and they are given a curse. And what is that curse? For a woman, it's that childbearing would be painful. This thing which is supposed to be beautiful and wonderful would be attended with pain. In other words, life begins in pain. And then what's Adam's? That the ground will no longer bear fruit easily. You will have to toil. You will have to work. And so life becomes painful. But he does not say that we're just going to scrap it. He says that you now are in this relationship that's going to require pain, difficulty, trial. It will not be easy like it once was. It is now going to be difficult. And yet we are going to maintain this, that when a husband Or when a man leaves his mother and father, he will be united to his wife and they will still become one flesh and they will now have a marriage, but this marriage will be difficult. And they say, well, then why does Moses say, explain to us how Moses says, listen, if your wife is displeasing, she has the obligation. And they would go back to that passage and they would say this, that the wife is supposed to long after her husband, and the husband is supposed to care for his wife. That's where the patriarchy kind of is established in the Old Testament. And it's not a real popular view in, in today's society, which is a more egalitarian, that men and women are equal. But God actually says, listen, the way in which men and women work together is not like a, like a business deal. It's not contractual. It's actually God makes men and women differently to come together and in mutual love, in mutual submission. There is no one better than the other, but that there is this desire for one another and a serving of one another. And when that breaks down and it 
quite often does, Jesus says, listen, the reason that God allowed for divorce in the Old Testament, the reason that there's laws about it, is because your hearts were hard. There does come a point in which we can harden our hearts towards God. We can become embittered. We can become unfaithful. And so Jesus says, that's not the purpose of marriage. Marriage is not a contract that you sign for your own benefit, but it is something which comes with obligation towards one another and obligation towards God. And when you fail on that issue, it is usually because there's sin in your life and there's a hardening of a heart and there's a refusal to meet that obligation. And so Jesus says, that's why. But he says, that's not what God's intent is for your marriage. And so I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, with the exception, in other words, he says, unless there is a gross sin, and it's actually a similar to this idea of nakedness. It has to do with this sexual immorality in which that which was designed to bring a couple together and build this incredible bond that they have, that when that goes outside of the marriage, and there is unfaithfulness, and it can be in all kinds of different ways in which you abandon your responsibility and your duty to your wife or your husband, and you move out of that, and you harden your heart that there comes a point when God lets you go. And we see this time and time again that, that God uses this as an example of what God's people do to God all the time. When they worship idols, when they harden their hearts and they move away from Him. And so He says, in this situation... That's where, as, there, as a husband, there is a, a right to serve a divorce certificate. But that's not what God desires. He actually desires for that marriage to grow in love and faithfulness. And so while divorce is a reality that Jesus both acknowledges and accepts that sometimes this takes place, and certainly has in our day and age, there are many reasons why people get divorced. And one of the great dangers of this passage is sometimes it can come across as, you know, God hates divorced people, right? Or that divorced people are on a different lower level than, than married people. Like if you have a really long marriage, that's the best. And if you have a divorce, you're kind of a lower grade person. That's not what Jesus is saying in this passage at all. What he's saying is this. God hates the sin that leads to divorce. He hates the sin which causes people to harden their hearts, to abandon one another, to abandon their relationships, both with each other and with Him. He wants there to be love and unity. And so when this takes place, and, and the basic you know, command here that Jesus gives to the, these leaders is to say, guys, you have a responsibility your obligation is to your wife and to care for her. And unless there is a gross rejection of marriage and unfaithfulness and a walking away, then it is your responsibility to care for your wife. That's it. He doesn't let them off the hook. In fact, he says, and if you abandon your wife, if you serve her divorce papers, you're the one that's committed adultery. And some have taken this passage along with some other, you know, another passage and in Corinthians, which we won't, uh, won't get to today, to kind of say, well, once you get one shot at marriage and that's it. And that's not really what the Bible says. Actually, the Bible says that, that you know, you can be remarried after a divorce. You can be remarried after your spouse uh, dies. Um, but you are to take it very, very seriously, marriage very seriously. And, and so uh, a danger can come is that we, like I said, divorce it uh, from chapter 17, which is really focusing on God's grace, that God has grace, He has forgiveness. And so a second marriage can represent and can reflect the glory of God, but in the context of doing it in a biblical way. And so there's hope for that. And I've known many people who have experienced that restoration in a second marriage. All right, let's go to verse 10 real quick. I realize we're going to run out of time today. 
It says, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. And uh, they said, basically, if you take away a man's ability to get rid of his wife if he's unhappy, then maybe he should just forget the whole thing. This is, this is our attitude, by the way, in society, isn't it? This is no-fault divorce, right? If, if I stop being happy in my marriage and I can't get out of it, it's better to be single. In fact, there's, they were kind of the original, the OG red pillars. You guys know about red pill? No, I didn't think so. Uh, I'm just looking at the general audience. Um, there's this movement of young men, uh, much younger than myself today, that that are called red pillars, and, and they're online, and they basically are saying, you, you can't get married. Don't get married. Because the legal system in society is, is set up to advance or advantage the woman in, in marriage. She gets to keep the kids. She can take your earnings. She can do all this. In other words, stay unmarried and stay in control of your life, because if you get married, you could lose control the way the legal system is set up. And to some degree, they're right. And that's kind of what the disciples are saying. They're like, well, what, you know, what advantage is there to get married, to take a wife you don't even know? And it could be good. It could be terrible. I don't know what's going to happen. And what does Jesus respond? It's a fascinating response because I, in some ways it doesn't even feel like he's answering the question. Um, but I think he is in kind of a, a roundabout way. He says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those whom it has been given. And then he starts talking about eunuchs. And every time he talks about eunuchs, I always think of my Hungarian friend uh, who was trying to learn English, and he would just go to the, the dictionary and come up with words. And so he was using the term eunuch. And, uh, and what he w- meant was unique. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's trying to use the word unique. And I was like, there's a big difference between unique and eunuch. Um, it doesn't sound like it if, you're, if you don't speak the language, but, but it's a big difference uh, between those two words. Uh, and Jesus essentially says, listen, not everybody gets married. Not everybody uh, ends up in a, in a marriage relationship. And some people, they're born into a situation in which they can't get married. They can't have that intimacy of marriage. And for other people, maybe something's been done to them against their will. They've been abused. They've been, um, they live in this fallen world, and so they can't end up in a marriage for, for other reasons because of things that have happened to them. And he says, and then there's some people who simply choose to be single. They choose to live a life, and it's at this point that he says, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. You know, Paul deals with this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, like I said, we won't get into it, but 1 Corinthians 7, 28 says, but if you do marry, because he, he speaks about marriage, and you have, you have not sinned, so he says, that's good. If you get married, it's, it's okay to get married. If you've been married before, it's okay to get remarried again. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned, okay? It's okay if you've never been married to get married, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you of this, Paul says. Well, thanks, Paul. That's nice. Um, <laughs> Paul uh, emphasizes the importance that God has sometimes called people to devote themselves to the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus is, is challenged at one point in, uh, by the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. And the way they came at him was to say, well, if we get to heaven and you're raised, then you've been married two or three times, and who's your wife? That's kind of awkward. And, and Jesus actually says, listen, in this age, in this life, people are given to marriage, and you get married, and that's a part of it. But when we get to heaven, we won't have spouses. We'll live in relationship with God. And if you are in a place of singleness, whether that's becoming a widow or whether that's through divorce or whether that's through whatever reason, Jesus lays out there's different reasons, that you are not outside of the kingdom of heaven, that God has his purpose, right, from the very beginning is that you would be in relationship with God, that you would have a right relationship with God, that you can reflect the image of God and be careful when you enter into marriage because it's difficult, it's hard. And uh, I was reading about uh, 
the people who were the married the longest before they got divorced. And it was a couple, you can remember this, is about 10 years ago, and there was a couple in Italy. They were married 77 years, and the husband found out that the wife had had a fling or something in the 1940s <laughs> and uh, had written, it was back when they like written, found letters, right? And it was like written letters, and so he just couldn't deal with it, so he divorced his wife after 77 years. Do you know what the fastest uh, divorce was? This Kuwaiti couple went in, they got married at the, in, in the courtroom, and as they were leaving the courtroom, uh, the wife tripped over her dress and fell on the ground. And instead of helping his bride up, uh, the husband laughed at her and called her stupid. And so she got up and went back to the judge and asked to have the marriage annulled. And, um, <laughs> and he did. So they had a three-minute marriage. And I only say that because I think probably some of us had mar- have had marriages where we wish it was only three minutes, right? <laughs> it can be very difficult to be married. It comes with a lot of pain and a lot of dying to oneself, a lot of obligations. And I think that's Jesus' point to these Pharisees, to these men, to say, you have an obligation to give up yourself. And Jesus didn't just tell us this. What did Jesus do? He went to the cross and demonstrated his love for us by giving up himself. So I would just close with three quick things. Points of application, and then we'll we'll just read one more verse and we'll be finished today. I have much more that we could talk about in regards to marriage that we'll just take all these notes and put them over here and then uh, move on. Should we pursue marriage? Yes, of course. And God has, from the beginning, ordained that. Um, Should we idolize it? Jesus says, no. God's great purpose for you is not that you be married. I think the evangelical church has kind of um, rewritten John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have a great marriage and a healthy family and live in a picket fence, right? Like that's... That's kind of the idea, that that's the elevation of, no, that you would have everlasting life, that you are welcomed into the eternal kingdom of God the Father, that you are restored in your relationship to God. So if you're in a loving marriage today, I would just challenge you this, that it is always under attack. Never stop working and cultivating in your marriage. There is always the temptation. There is no perfect marriage out there. There is always the temptation to allow sin to come in and harden your heart. And so when you find that sin, repent quickly and keep asking God to keep you humble and serve your spouse. Practice mutual submission. To those who have a struggling marriage, it may be a marriage that's on the rocks. Probably most of us have people who we know that their marriage is maybe coming to an end. The real question is to ask yourself is where is the hardness of heart? Is it in your spouse or is it in you? Now, you can't change your spouse's hard heart. But you have access to God the Father who can melt yours. And so make sure that it is not your bitterness and your anger and your misery that's the problem. Allow God to do that work in your heart. And Paul has a good good thoughts on this, like I said, and 1 Corinthians 7. And then for those who are single, this is a hard thing in this life, but remember this is a temporal life. And the great gift that God has given you is himself. That he has loved you, that he has died on the cross for your sins, that he has redeemed you, and that you can be with him. And so go to him daily. Let him be what you need. And trust that if there is a relationship that he has for you, that it will come in due time. Let's close then with Revelation chapter 21. As I said, Jesus is not just speaking in general. He's speaking very specifically. Marriage itself reflects the glory of God. And Jesus would come and restore his people, Israel, who had
loved other gods, who had been unfaithful, who had essentially been adulterers. But in Revelation 21, John sees a new heaven and a new earth. This is verse 1 through 4. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away.